the Tie Cats Audio Network. This is the CFL This Week with Bubba O'Neill. Welcome to this week's edition of the CFL This Week. Again, our weekly program and podcast, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on your favorite place to listen to podcasts, of course, the topic being the Canadian Football League. Another week has passed yet. More controversies, more things to talk about. Wins, losses, uh, surprising plays and surprising movements. So let's get right to it. And again, as we always do, we have an outstanding roundtable cast to join us. Let's start from east to west. Taylor Shire, he's a reporter and anchor with Global Regina. Taylor, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. Will Nolt, he's the co-host of The Big Show on Sportsnet. It's 960 The Fan in Calgary. Will, thanks for joining us for the first time. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Awesome to be here. And uh, he's no stranger to us here on the CFL this week. Jim Mullen, he's the president of Football Canada and the host of Crown Gridiron Nation. Jim, what's going on in the West Coast? It's sunny and it's beautiful here on Bowen Island. I'm not sure what it's like back east, but it is just beautiful out here right now. Yeah, th- thanks for rubbing in. It's it's just been raining every single day here in Ontario. So leave me alone. Guys, let's talk. Ottawa, the Red Blacks have two wins this season, both against the Edmonton Elks. What? Uh, like, come on. Then they roll out a rookie quarterback by the name of Caleb Evans, he throws three touchdown passes in his debut. Taylor, I'll start with you. Is he the real deal? Well, that game seemed like a week ago. Well, it was, <laughs> which is crazy to think. Uh, you know, wrapping up the weekend of, of football, it's, oh, it was last week, midweek. Um, but, yeah, I, I, Caleb Evans, he's not the real deal yet. He, one game is not going to show me, especially against a team like that, is not going to tell me that he's the real deal yet. But he showed signs that he, you know, he could be a building block for that team. Um he's going to have to put together at least a half a season, if not more of consistent games against good teams to, to prove that he's a real deal, but he looked good early. However, I think that was more indicative of the Elks uh, poor defense and and poor pass coverage. Well, well, they kind of had two quarterbacks there. It was either going to be him or doc Hodges. Uh, Again, do you keep going forward with Caleb Evans? Yeah, that's where I was going to go. I mean, he only threw it 22 times. So like Taylor said, it's really impossible to tell if he is the real deal. But, you know, this is a, a team that, as you say, it has two wins. They, I, I think for a lot of people's money, have been the worst in the CFL this season. Uh, that win perhaps could keep their year alive with three games against Montreal still to go. And, I mean, that was the best quarterback performance they got all season long without question. So if I'm Paul LaPolice in the Red Blacks, I see no reason to at least give this kid a shot, see what you've got in the 23-year-old. And the thing that impressed me the most, as Taylor mentioned, yes, it was more indicative of the Elks and how poor they were that night. But this kid was not afraid to take shots. He was athletic. He ran the football. Uh, he was able to get some you know, good yardage with his legs. So, yeah, I, I see no reason based on how the first half of the year, their year went. If I'm Paul LaPolice, I go right back to that kid. And they play two games this week, so it'll be curious to see what happens in Week 10. Jim, it, there was a lot of talk in this province, at least, about the general manager being on the hot seat. Um, does that give him a week off here? Uh, what do you do with Matt Nichols, who comes out of price? Dominic Davis, again, a veteran, 31 years old. These guys have had plenty of opportunities. Do you move away from these fellas? I'm not sure if you necessarily move away from them. I, I was just thinking about, you know, one great game for a quarterback. All of a sudden we're anointing him as the next starter for the next few years for the team in Ottawa. And I go back to a time where in the Canadian football league, where there was more uh, personnel stability and you earned your way onto a roster by carrying a clipboard for, for at least two years and, and learning the nuances of the game and having someone there to mentor you. So you need that that veteran presence uh, like, like a Nichols uh, on your roster still if you want to get the most out of Caleb. Uh, you really do. One game isn't going to define what his uh, career path is going to be in the Canadian Football League. We've, we've seen a lot of these guys pop up before and then disappear rather rapidly. We've also seen a guy like Vernon Adams uh, who bounced around and, and and had some flashes of greatness but couldn't sustain it, finally matured to a point 
uh, where we can see now that that VA is maybe the most exciting player <laughs> in the Canadian Football League, yet yet still has some consistency problems, but has established himself as a starting quarterback. It's a long road to establishing yourself as a regular starting quarterback in any professional league. So uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the supporting cast right now from uh, from Mr. Flash in the pan, you got to keep that supporting cast around. And, and as as the Jardins goes, uh, he's been on the hot seat a couple of times uh, o- over the years. Uh, ownership really likes him and stands by him. And I don't see, especially in this abbreviated season, any sudden moves uh, until they get into the off season. The two but- things out of that for me. Sorry, I, I just wanted to, no. to jump in there because. You know, it's a great point. I mean, how long did, did everyone across the league say James Franklin was the next superstar in this league? And, I mean, what did he do? End up doing nothing. And, and in fact, he's now retired from professional football. But I see it two different ways, Jim. And I'm wondering where you see it. Because in one direction, yeah, James Franklin was anointed forever and never lived up to that hype. This kid, it's one game. But maybe it's not such the case in Canadian football, but pro sports in general, we're seeing a younger generation make a better impact immediately. And I do wonder if some of that old school is the wrong way to put it, but the old way of, you know, you got to bid your time. You got to carry a clipboard, all that. Like sometimes you just find that guy. Now I'm saying Caleb Evans after 22 times, he's thrown the football. No, I'm not saying that he's the next guy in Ottawa, but I do think that mindset's changed a little bit. Do you see it the same way or no? I think in every position except quarterback. Uh, I think that you can find those uh, uh, raw rookies that you can throw into a professional situation, and you're still going to have an issue with uh, with consistency uh, out of those positions. Um, it, it, and it, it, you're right. It doesn't matter about what sport. There, there's a lot more of that. Uh, we experience that. Uh, watching the NHL, that that median age has come way down in the NHL over the last 15 years in an arc. Uh, my favorite baseball team, the Seattle Mariners, uh, you know that they they've pushed some rookies up into the major leagues, uh, maybe a little bit before their time. But there's there's still a point there where you have to manage it at the at, at the yeah. top levels, right? Uh, confidence is a big thing. Uh, if you break confidence and development. Uh, you can set the development of a player back two, three years. So uh, the the way they bring Caleb Evans into situations, he's got to have that backing. Uh, you know, as much as the BC Lions have struggled uh, at times out here, and especially the after that first game uh, with with Michael Riley and his elbow situation, I really like the setup they have with him and Nathan Rourke, because Nathan Rourke has got a veteran that he can learn off of. He can go in there for spot duty. Uh, he can develop and understand the system and understand the different dynamics of the professional game, even coming from a Division I uh, program that he led quite successfully over his four years there. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transition to the professional game, and it's good to have good mentorship around you at the end of the day, just in that position alone. Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, Taylor, last thing on this here, and it, it's funny that you guys talk about the mentorship, carrying the clipboard, and, and I'm wondering if that's just a time that we've long passed. I mean, we'll go south of the border, National Football League, Josh Allen, uh, uh, the kid in uh, uh, San Diego. These guys are like drafted and boom, you're anointed number one and you're expected to perform. And then should that not be the same expectation in this league? Yeah, it, it, there, there's two different trains of thought south of the border, north of the border. I think the quarterback positions are totally different, but I think south of the border in the NFL, there's a lot of pressure from the fan base and, and even from sort of the outside world to get the flashy young quarterback, the high draft pick in right away, as opposed to biding his time behind a a veteran quarterback, you know, you don't have to be behind Tom Brady or Aaron Rodgers or somebody like that, but you know, professional guy who's been around guy like Nick Foles or somebody like that, where you're, you know, you learn one or two years, you let the old guy start, you learn from him and then you get put in year three. Um, you know, you can see spot duty in the first two years, but I think year three is when you really take off, you, you grasp everything, you stay within the systems, you learn everything. I think you're, you're set up for much more success that way, but with the pressure of winning now, the pressure of the outside world, why aren't you playing the the high draft pick, the flashy quarterback who's going to make mistakes, uh, but he could, you know, he could go off in one game. I think there's just too much pressure. 
um, from the outside and in terms of the NFL and the CFL is way different. I think there should be much more of an emphasis on developmental where you do have young quarterbacks in the system and they are learning from the veterans because there's a lot of veteran quarterbacks to go around. Um, not necessarily, I don't necessarily think there's nine veterans that can start uh, this year and, and put up winning records for their teams. A guy like Matt Nichols, I think has fallen off so far, but I think for Caleb Evans, he can still learn a lot from watching Matt Nichols and going through practice with him and, and having that succession plan in place. Um, if Evans is going to be their guy. Jim, your BC Lions were taken to task by, I guess, what we would assume are the top team in the Canadian Football League by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Kenny Lawler, 12 receptions, 205 yards. I think he got into the end zone as well, too. If I was given a question list or name the 10 top receivers at the beginning of the year, Kenny Lawler does not make my list. (laughs) Did he make your list? Is he the best receiver in the Canadian Football League? Well, a couple of things about that. I think if there's one team uh, in the CFL that has uh, done the best job in terms of finding the Kenny Lawlers, it's it's the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. The uh, personnel department there is uh, is head and shoulders right now above the rest of the Canadian Football League. And when you look at their success at the end of the day, and obviously they're they're easily the number one team right now in my mind, outpacing the rest of uh of this uh of this league it, it comes down to guys that you don't see uh danny mcmanus ted gavaya those guys who are out in the field finding these guys and bringing them back uh to the winnipeg blue bombers so um yeah kenny lawler he, he like he's he's one of the he, kenny lawler's there and lucky whitehead is here in bc that they, they knew that they could let a guy like Whitehead go to BC in free agency because they got the next up, right? Um, but uh, Kenny Lawler being that productive is, is, uh, is a byproduct, is a byproduct of protection for the quarterback, is a byproduct of uh, that Winnipeg offensive line, is a byproduct of the BC Lions deciding to go um, quick and mid-sized on their defensive line and they're kind of learning a lesson from that. That that is their Achilles heel right now. Is, is their is their defensive line. It's why the Elks came in here and won because they dominated with the running game. Uh, it's why the Winnipeg Blue Bombers had an easier time on offense because they had time to throw the ball. And uh, one of the things I like to open up to all the guys here is let's take a look across the, the Canadian Football League. Outside of the Bombers, it would seem that everyone is showing their Achilles heel. Every one of these teams has a has a major flaw to it. Is it, you know with your team in your backyard? Do you, do you see a major flaw with with your team? I, I see it with the BC Lions and their and their defensive front. Uh, what about you guys? Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I think for the Stampeders, it's it's been the the conversation for really the entire year going in and the off season. Everyone's like, who's going to catch the football? Who's going to you know finish drives for this team? I, I think their inability to finish drives on offense, their receivers dropping balls everywhere, uh, and and really you go back to 2019, they were I believe dead last in in rushing the football. That continues to be a huge problem for this team and. I mean, the problem nobody saw coming in Calgary was Bolivar Mitchell does not look like Bolivar Mitchell. And there's a lot going on there. I know last game he admitted that, you know, there's, there's been some shoulder issues that have been bugging him. Uh, you could see that it, it affected him in the second half of that game against Saskatchewan. The first half, he actually looked like the elite Bolivar Mitchell that we have, have come to know. And, and you're thinking, oh, maybe this is the turnaround of Calgary season. But um, that, that to me is, is this team's biggest issue. I think, the coaching staff on defense has done a nice job plug in play. And you, you mentioned Winnipeg's ability to find, you know, the next guy up. Well, Calgary's done that on defense, I think the last couple of years. And yeah, they, they've got their odd game where they do look like a, a bit of Swiss cheese. But I, I think overall, if you were look, looking at the Stamp Peters and, and why they are where they are, it's because they have not been able to finish drives and their receivers have dropped balls at some very, very key moments. And when you don't have a run game as a defense, it's pretty easy to pin your ears back and go after the quarterback. Well, I would have thought, I mean, maybe not going into this season, but just last year alone, Will, uh, there could have been three receivers that I could have possibly said would be the the best receiver in the Canadian Football League. And uh, numbers obviously diminished somewhat. Taylor, 
I don't know. It just doesn't even sound right to me. Uh, in terms of like Kenny Lawler, number one. Yeah, I would say he wouldn't be in my top 10 list uh, heading into the season. Lucky Whitehead might not have even made the list. Um, but 2019 is a long time ago. And, and there's some new guys coming to, coming to the top here in 2021. Look at a guy like Darrell Walker, Greg Ellingson. Um, I think Brian Burnham is still probably my number one guy. So he hasn't really taken a step back, I don't think. But um, even Brandon Banks, maybe he would have been you know, 1A to, to Burnham this year. He hasn't really shown much Braylon Addison came back this week he looked good uh, out east um and then you know Eric Rogers and, and guys like that are still near the top Gino Lewis but Shaq Evans a healthy Shaq Evans so I, there's you know there's eight nine guys that I just listed that I would have put ahead of Kenny Lawler but um I think until Lawler becomes that go-to guy night in and night out for Winnipeg I think he had one target or one catch the week prior so to me he's not the best in the CFL until he's that eight reception guy every week um, whether he goes off because that was that was his first hundred yard game this year. Yeah, it was a two hundred yeah. yard game, whatever it was. But uh, <laughs> but he hadn't put up a he hasn't put up a hundred yard game yet this season. I feel like they almost don't have to because they run the ball so well. They may be the most balanced team uh, in the Canadian Football League. Let's let's go out east, guys. Uh, here in Hamilton, I I, w- I have to admit I was really really surprised to hear the fans be so voice boisterous about David Watford replacing Jeremiah Masoli in that game. Now, I don't know if they were thinking for the game. I don't know if they wanted to see Watford for a couple of series. What I do know is that they lost the game to the Alouettes, and they're 500. Like, this is a team that I think maybe all three of you would have picked to be the Winnipeg Blue Bombers in 2021. What's going on with the Tiger Cats there, Taylor? I still have them coming out of the East. And – they don't look like they're going to be at the top of the East, but they're, I think they'll be the Eastern Eastern champion. They'll, uh, they'll head into the great cup. I just think their defense is too strong when November and December roll around and we're playing football games in the snow and, and whatever the temperatures might be, that defense is just too good. And they don't necessarily need the most prolific offense to keep going. I think they need Masoli or Evans because Watford is not the guy to, he can manage a game. He can throw three yard passes but he's not going to be winning uh, winning games in the fourth quarter on the final drives. Um, I think Masoli, I think when, when they do get their receiving core back and fully healthy, uh, I think we, we saw signs of it on, on the weekend in terms of bringing back Banks and Addison and even uh, uh, the running back, Thomas Erlington. But I think they eventually will overtake Toronto, will come through Montreal. And whether they finish first or not, I, I think that doesn't really matter. I think they'll get through in the playoffs and, They'll eventually be that team, whether it's Masoli or Evans uh, guiding them at quarterback, but it won't be Watford. Will, w- w- Will, was this just a, a, a thing where the fans are being fans? A hundred percent. And it's funny because I don't necessarily disagree with Taylor, but his statement is more about how, once again, how disastrous the East division is than really Hamilton's season. Because I, I don't think that Hamilton has shown that, yeah, that's a team that's going to be in the great cup, but yeah, I don't see them losing in the same breath to a Toronto or a Montreal on a winner-take-all type playoff situation. Now, I will say this, though, and we've seen this, I think, in Calgary a little bit the last couple of seasons, but, you know, pressure, expectation, the fact you're hosting the Grey Cup, I think all of that has played into what we're seeing in Hamilton this season. And, I mean, kind of like Bo Levi Mitchell in a way, too. Like, Jeremiah Masoli has just not been the same player for the last – two years and you know Dane Evans I think has been the better quarterback when the two are healthy um and so I I think all that playing in you know Jim and I talked earlier about how important the quarterback position is in this league and when you're getting inconsistency like they've been getting at quarterback and you look at how like you know through the two thirds of the season they've had all three guys really share the field Um, nobody's really had that job for, for any sort of consistent amount of time. So I think all that is playing into the tie cats being a four and four. Yeah. I, I, I picked them to go all the way at the start of the season. Like Taylor, I still think there's a very good chance they go to the great cup, but Jim, I think, I think pressure expectation, the fact they're hosting this thing, the fact that everybody and their dog picked them to win the East division. uh, I, I think all that's playing into what we're seeing so far this year. And to your point, at the start of the year, I had a friend of mine reach out to me about uh, 
who had the best chance to come out of the East and get into the uh, Grey Cup. Now, I don't bet. I don't put money down, but this guy does. And uh, I said, oh, Hamilton will be there in the Eastern final, but Vernon Adams and the Montreal Alouettes are going to go in there and steal the Eastern final. They may not be the best team, but because of those things that you mentioned, that that lay, those layers of pressure in Hamilton, hosting the Grey Cup, that's a huge weight. We've seen it time and again o- o- over decades about host teams in the Grey Cup losing their final game either in the West or the East. Um, you know, it, it, and the thing that really worries me about the Ticats, as you mentioned, with those three quarterbacks it's almost like they're at 500 right now. It's a stalemate for them because it's almost like like a like a like a half the season's been an exhibition season for them. Like like they 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 haven't congealed at that position. I know that they've had a number of injuries and and, and uh, some players rotating through. But you know what? Now it's time to decide what the identity is of this Hamilton Tiger Cats offense. Uh, if if they have a hope, because I, I do not see, even if they find a way to get their game together, even if they find a way to first place, um, them developing the consistency to be reliable after that two weeks off going into the Eastern final against a Toronto or a Montreal. This this is a team that could easily be taken out because of all that external pressure that that is there in that town. Well, I mean, and there's certainly been the receiver issues. I mean, they finally get Addison back. They released Devere Posey, who was their big free agent acquisition to really complete that wide receiver core. There's clearly something wrong with Brandon Banks, or all of a sudden he turned 40 years old. He almost doesn't look as quick as what we saw in 2019, where he was easily the most dominant wide receiver in the game. Masoli 0-2 out of the gate. Now, mind you, those were real tough road games in Winnipeg on opening night. And of course, going into Saskatchewan, going to Regina, where, you know, I think he was sacked six times. The defensive line of the Riders was just unbelievable that night. So it's like you haven't really, the, the, the two best wins were these simple wins with a simple offense with David Watford. And I, I don't know. I mean, you, I, you're right. You got these two higher price quarterbacks. You got to be able to roll with one of them. Will I would believe. Yeah, no, you, you have to find somebody that's going to give you some sort of traction to uh, give yourselves a, a chance. And, you know, Taylor brought it up earlier, I think. And you just talked about it. You know, Brandon Banks was the top of everybody's list and he has been so ineffective that they have to kind of change their game plan to dinking and ducking and they can't stretch the field like they've been, been used to. And, and, um, you know, you, you factor that in with some poor special teams play at times too. And um, I, I don't know who I would go to. I, I, like I say, I think when they're both healthy, I, I've liked Dane Evans better, but um, I, I think you have to factor in the, the, the fact that Missouri's had some tough matchups and, if they're gonna if they're gonna make it and, and and be that host team in the Great Cup, they're gonna have to find some quarterback to give them some sort of life on offense. And unfortunately, they haven't been able to do that. And and um, when you're playing the three down game, if you can't stretch the field and you're forced with second and eight, second and seven, well, you're putting yourself in a really really tough spot. And they've been doing that all season long. Bubba, right, I got a I got a quick yeah, point here. Sure. You know, I think I was on your on your first uh, uh, podcast this year. And, you know, one of the points that I brought up and I, that, that I'd heard through the league was that after 650 days off, the biggest issue was going to be injuries uh, and mm-hmm. how injuries were going to erode consistency. And I think that's what we've seen so far uh, right across the CFL. And I think it's contributed uh, in part to offenses not being as productive. Uh, the, the odd thing that I see, and this is a really deep dig here because I'm producing a, a college uh, football TV show is going through box scores. They're still producing offenses at the U sports level. Like I I see 900, 1000, 1100 yards in total offense in a lot of these U sports games, but it ain't happening in the CFL. And and one of the questions I had coming into this today was why, what, (laughs) where have all the offenses gone in the CFL? Is it that injuries? Is that consistency thing? It like we talked about quarterbacks. Do we not have the quality quarterbacks here uh, to operate? Is it a personnel thing? 
Um, it, it, you know, I can go back to when they expanded rosters back around uh, 2011 and, and it allowed coaches to bring defensive specialists in on different downs and different situations. And we started to see the numbers drop off then. Like, where have the offenses gone? I mean, it's great that we had an exciting yeah. game uh, out of Hamilton because we haven't had enough of those this year. But even I, that, I mean, there was what forty points scored. I mean, yeah. the, this is the Sasky game with the with Calgary. What forty points scored? Like it, you're right. I mean, and that's a noticeable thing because was that guy's not one of the selling points of the Canadian Football League? Wide open football, high scoring, exciting plays. Yes, there's been some really exciting games and completions to games, wild finishes. But you're right. The the offensive numbers and production way down all across the board. Yeah, there's been a lot of unders. Uh, if you're if you're a better, <laughs> there's been a lot of unders this year. And I mean, it, from the Riders' standpoint, I think they have nine new starters from 2019. So to get that offense, to get that chemistry, um, their offense is totally different. Sure, they have the same quarterback, Kyron Moore, and the running back, uh, and one offensive lineman, but. They have a whole bunch of new receivers, a whole bunch of new offensive linemen. So they are still gelling a bit in terms of developing that chemistry on a consistent basis. And I think to your point, Bubba, that is across the league where there is, you know, these offenses are still trying to pick up from that year off and, and get that chemistry and get that familiarity back. And the defenses I think are, are picking up on a lot of that and just playing better than the offenses overall. And I don't know what the situation is like in BC or, or Regina. I, I obviously haven't been been paying close attention to each team's injury report week by week, but I believe the Calgary Stampeders, you know, to that point, I think they've only had two games this year where they've had the same five offensive linemen. It's been a, you know, a carousel, whether it's been injuries, whether it's been illness, um, you know, you get guys placed on the one game injured list all the time. And I, I think out of the, you know, eight, nine games that everybody's played across the league. I, I bet you that stats pretty close for a lot of teams that they have not had the consistency. And, and listen, the old linemen, the D linemen, uh, the, the trenches, they, they don't get the sexy headlines. So nobody really, I don't think pays that, that close attention if you're an average fan or unless you're, you know, dialed in. But I, I think across the league, there's, there's been, you know, the injuries to your slot back or your running back. Those are the ones that everyone's like, ah, oh, he's out of this game. But, Nobody pays attention to the fact that maybe the offensive line has been that rotating carousel. And when you don't have that, we talk about chemistry and confidence. You don't have that as a quarterback confidence that your guys are going to block or, or, you know, the, the comfortability with, with your offensive line. I think that plays a huge role and I'm not trying to let anybody off the hook, but I think that plays a huge part for sure. Yeah. How many retirements did they have on the offensive line in Ottawa before they went into the season last minute ones? it was yep. at least two. It may have been three. And uh, when, when I saw those stories popping up around the Red Blacks, I knew that they were in for a very long year, even though it was only a 14-game season. Well, that's sort of been an issue, too. I mean, the retirement of Mike Filer has been a huge issue on that offensive line. I mean, Dane Evans might have been the best protected quarterback in 2019, and he put up the numbers to to certainly produce a, a team that went to the Grey Cup. Guys, one more sort of league issue thing, and I don't know what you guys think about this, but you know what? I come home, I put on the converter, I start flipping around. It's a Monday, it's a Tuesday, it's a Wednesday, it's a Thursday, a Friday, and Saturday – and there could be a CFL game on. Now, that is totally against the norm of what we've normally seen in this league. Now, I don't know. Taylor, we'll start with you here. Should that become the norm? Games nope. on any day of the week. You know what? It was a nice surprise to watch a game on a Tuesday or whatever it was. But, no, they need they need that consistency. I think they have tried a little bit over the years. They've gone away from all those Sunday games. Uh, especially when the NFL is gone. I think that is a major thing to not have those Sunday games to compete with the NFL. Cause there's a lot of people that are fans of both that want to watch both. Um, I think the Friday night game is, is great. I think um, the Saturday triple header might need a bit of, I don't think that's really sustainable um, for a guy like me to sit and watch three football games. When I got two kids running around, I, I can't really do that. So um, I need, I need bite sizes. Double headers are great. I think uh, you have everything set up, uh, but the, yeah, so I don't know where to put that extra game. I think a Friday night game is good and then a Saturday doubleheader, but where does that extra game go? Yeah, for me, I I mean, I'm, I'm the uh, old school that I can sit on the couch and, and watch for nine hours. You do it on Sundays. Why can't you do it on Saturdays? I've always thought that if you're the CFL, 
the best thing to do is have your showcase, you know, your game of the week on the Friday and then have your triple header on Saturday. And if you didn't want to go that way and if you wanted to have sponsors, you could have Thursday night football, Friday night football, you know, whether, you know, insert sponsor A, sponsor B here for those two games and finish your week with a double header on Saturday. But I, I think one of those two models needs to be adopted full time because one of the biggest issues I've had, you know, talking to average sports fans about the CFL is to exactly what you just talked about, Bubba. You don't know when games are on. I mean, you've got to have that set schedule. And I think the CFL has tried at different points. Uh, obviously, the triple header has been, uh, you know, tried a couple times in the last few years. But, yeah, whether it's the Friday night showcase, your game of the week, and a triple header Saturday, or you go Thursday, Friday, double header Saturday, I, I think one of those two models, Jim, should be used full time going forward. But but Jim, I mean th- when you were flipping around and you saw a game on Tuesday night or Wednesday night, did you turn it off? Yeah, cuz like- it was Ottawa and Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean Ottawa Edmonton was an easy one for the PVR and, and the and the Zoom button, <laughs> as, especially when you know, I, I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of people in the GTA that were getting amped up on uh and, and across Canada that were getting amped up on the Blue Jays. Uh, and their run in, in the pennant. Uh, you know, I was amped up on the Seattle Mariners. Yeah, their, sorry about their that, run Jim. towards the yeah. pennant. <laughs> um, you know, you got to, when you start spreading it out across the week, you got to make choices uh, as a viewer. Uh, if there's one thing that has uh, tremendous value in today's media market, it's the attention of these, attention of your eyes. That's the thing with the most value right now. Everyone's competing for attention. Um, you know, Tuesday games are for the Mac, right? They're not, they're, 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 they're for, they're for mid major conferences that are trying to find a way to, uh, to, to get into your living room. If the CFL goes back to a cadence of um, Thursday night games uh, through, through the uh, late spring and summer, um, and then the Friday, Saturday uh, combination, that's the place where they should be. Uh, I know as a, as a guy who likes to follow college and even junior football, I kind of like that space in, in, in the Saturdays where I can go watch some college football as well. Um, so it really comes down to, uh, to picking your spots. Uh, I would say avoid Sundays at all costs with the, with the exception of the playoffs, though. I, I agree with you. Stay away from the Sundays. I mean, the National Football League is way too much of a juggernaut. Yeah, the gambling, blah, blah, blah. But and, and Jim, you kind of crossed on it there, too. And I'm a big fan of the following the OUA. And I don't know what's going on in Canada West for you guys as well, too. I don't know what if I feel like they're trying to build something with the OUA. But then you throw in a CFL game and you're kind of you're kind of crushing it as well, too. I, I, I feel there's a lot of allegiance in the queue with Montreal and Laval. And they have like their own separate audience that I think we're in Ontario trying to establish that kind of a, an allegiance to this product. But putting a CFL game on a Saturday afternoon, doesn't that really hurt the college product, uh, Taylor? Yeah, I think it's, it's such a tough juggling act because you got to also take into account the time zones. Um, if you want to have a Friday night game, well, out east, if, if it's in BC, you're not starting until, what, 1030. So, how, you know, if you're a CFL fan or if you're over in the Maritimes, uh, even speaking with Riders kicker Brett Lothar, he's like, my family has to start a game at midnight sometimes uh, if they want to watch me play. So they're watching from midnight to 3 a.m. So I think that's sort of a total different thing that the CFL scheduling has where they don't have that consistent time, say, 6 o'clock on Thursday or 7 o'clock on Thursday. That's kickoff because there is that time zone difference. So you'd have to have every Thursday game or every Friday game out east to start at, you know, at 6. So that's sort of a scheduling thing, but I, I think in terms of the competing with, uh, you know, whether it's junior football or whether it's university football, I, I I don't necessarily think it's direct competition. I think each one has their own fan base and whether, when there's a riders game and a Regina Rams game at the same time, there is a bit of a competition there, but I think people who are going to go to the Rams game um, will go regardless. And then they'll make it home to, for, to watch the rider game on TV. There's never going to be um, those games necessarily at the same time. I think the Rams do a good job of picking different time slots when the riders aren't playing. So they can either, you know, their fans can either watch online or go to the stadium when the riders are on the road. Well, 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, obviously Saskatchewan's a different animal. And, and to, you know, Taylor, I, I think the University of Saskatchewan, University of Regina, they obviously do a great job putting their product out and stuff. And, you know, in, in Alberta, you know, the Dinos have been one of the most successful programs yeah. in, in, in U, U sports in the last decade plus. And if you ask, you know, 10 Calgarians, I bet you not even half of them watch the Dinos play. And, and I think part of that is you need to try, try to find a way to get that exposure whether that is online now with the ability to watch everything at your fingertips i i think there's more ways to grow the game outside of worrying about your time zone or, or your you know your scheduling conflicts right now worry about getting your game out to your people and, and, and letting them make that decision because right now that decision doesn't really exist and it's really unfortunate because the dinos have been that good and yet i don't think a lot of people can can name you three players on the dinos uh, team this year so um that that i think is is you sports' biggest issue right now is find a way to get your game in front of people. Don't worry about CFL scheduling their games at the same time. Let's, let's make that decision a hard one first. And um, I hope they, you know, find a way to do that. And, and obviously, I don't know how you guys feel, but, you know, the, the, the Vanier Cup and the Great Cup being played on the same weekend, the same facility, I, I think was one of the greatest things they've done. And then when they went away from that, it was super disappointing. I know there's plans to do that again here in the future, but – um, that's one of the ways that I think you can continue to grow that program and, 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 you know, make you sports relevant on Saturdays. Cause right now, if you're not living in a place like Ontario, it, it is hard to, you know, unless you're really digging for it or you've got people that you know on that team, you're probably not going to find that when you're sitting on your couch channel flipping on a Saturday. Jim, you know, this, you know, this situation as well as any one of us, um, it's been an issue, I think over the years and Will brings up a great point about, the, the, the unification of the Grey Cup and the Vanier Cup. Uh, we saw it here in, in, it was in Toronto a couple of times where uh, I thought maybe the, maybe the best Vanier Cup we'd seen in 50 years was played. Uh, is that something that really should be a concern to both uh, associations? I was the director of the 2011 Vanier Cup in Vancouver. The first time they really integrated the Vanier in, in with the Grey Cup. And there were, you know, there were a lot of challenges behind the scenes with that. But, you know, uh, the, the best moment for me uh, organizing that event was getting a call from my ticket manager, not having a, a, a pair of tickets together to give away to a contest winner, which told me we had a lower bowl sellout. Um, you know, the audience is kind of built in with the Grey Cup. The, the, the unfortunate thing with this is that, the, you know, there is a desire from the CFL to start and end their season sooner than, than in uh, previous years. They're not aiming for that last weekend in November anymore. And there's no room for U sports to move all four of their conferences schedules yeah. earlier. Uh, that, that would mean uh, if, uh, if you move those things earlier, um, you end up with um, students losing out on the opportunity to take a job in the summer. Um, there's more costs with camps. You run games without students on campus. So I, I think that vision of the Vanier Cup being together with the Grey Cup is not something that's going to happen uh, in, in the near future, unfortunately. Now, is there an opportunity for, for instance, if Hamilton is uh, hosting a Grey Cup that you play the Yates Cup there because of the way the schedules work? Sure. And is that a, is that a, a springboard then? That when the when the CFL season ends, there's some awareness around that with a tremendous game. That then you have the bonus round and that traditional place on the calendar for football fans to go towards the end of end of November and and watch some championship football. Yeah, so there, there's there's something of a compromise there, I think. But getting back to uh, getting back to coordination between everyone, like you know, since I took the position of uh, president of football Canada two years ago, my, my main job has been to try to get people to cooperate and align. Like football is a very siloed sport. Um, you know, what the junior guys do over here, what the university people do over here, what the CFL does over here, even what NFL Canada does, no one's connected. It's the biggest frustration that we have in the sport behind the scenes. And, you know, a microcosm of that is what happened last Friday here in Vancouver. The UBC Thunderbirds decided to stage their homecoming game at the very same time the BC Lions were playing. Hmm. Now, you know, that that 
uh, you know, there's a challenge there with, with, with fans and fan base, but the bigger challenge is also behind the scenes because, you know, we have an ecosystem when it comes to the sport in, in this country. And so if you're running two major events at the same time, where do you get your broadcasters from? Where do you get your camera people from? Where do you get your game support from? You're eating, <laughs> you're, you're, you're eating into the same pie in, in right. terms of being able to, to uh, stage a successful event. So, you know, the, I think my biggest frustration over the last two years is um, seeing uh, the CFL and um, other stakeholders competing when it would benefit them to work together or to at least communicate. And, uh, and, and the, the sooner that, that that's solved, the sooner the entire sport, not just the business of the CFL, the entire sport can move ahead in a cohesive fashion. Well, there's my just, speech. There, 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 there's yeah. my speech. No, and not, and that's fair because I mean, from where you're coming from, at your your position, that that makes a lot of sense. And well, let me throw this to you. And it's funny that you did bring up uh, the Calgary Dinos, McMaster Marauders. They were Yates Cup uh, champions. They played, I believe, the Mitchell Bowl in Calgary, which I thought was a real good game. Uh, and I didn't know what to expect in terms of visuals, uh, in terms of fans. And it was a cold day in that Mitchell Bowl, but. I got to admit, I was a little disappointed and I was like, OK, well, I thought we were doing better in promoting both games, the U-Sport and the Canadian Football League. And I mean, was there a thousand people there? Probably not. Um, There's 800. Is... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and, and that's been that's been the biggest issue. Now, I, I think part of it is that, you know. I, I've thought about this for a long time and, and, you know, I grew up playing football in this city and, and um, you know, shoulder ice athletic park has grown tremendously. Um, that's, that's to me where the dinos should play their home games. Uh, I've called two Calgary Colts games this year. They played at shoulder ice. They've got better fans than, than the dinos have so far this year. And um, I mean, you're putting them in this massive, massive facility and it just, it falls flat. Um, it really does. And uh, I went to games to the Dinos as a kid on the sideline and I would like look up and be like, there's nobody here. It, it was, you know, it was, it was depressing now. I mean, in the nineties, they, after the, the, the one venue cup, they were, they were pretty bad there for a while, but still, um, you know, they've been that successful the last decade and it just hasn't been there in terms of a fan base. Now you go one province to the East where Taylor is and it's completely different. Um, you know, Saskatchewan and Regina, both fan bases. Now I think, Taylor, the Rams probably have the same problem the Dinos do sometimes when they play at Mosaic. And, um, you know, it looks like there's there's 200 people there because the stadium's so uh, so huge. But, um, yeah, if I'm the Calgary Dinos, I know it's not on campus. I know it's not ideal. But move your games to Shoulder Ice Park. Build yourself a locker room there. You've got so much room to have a, a beautiful practice facility and a, and, and a locker room. And um, if they do that, you can market it better. You, you're certainly going to get people. I'm, I'm sure you're going to get people there. Um, but yeah, playing in McMahon, I, I think, I think that experiment needs to come to an end. Last word to you, Taylor. Yeah. In terms of Regina, uh, the Rams and the Thunder for that matter, sometimes play, we have a nice facility, Libel field. They sometimes play there. Um, it's a great facility. It's more intimate. It's a, it's perfectly set up for junior football, but I think with the new stadium, there is a bit of uh, an alert for fans to, that maybe haven't been to a rider game to go into mosaic stadium and, and watch a game from the nice facility. That's brand new. Um, but I don't necessarily think that's the best home for them because they can, you know, they only get a few thousand fans and I think you, you get a better product and you get a better atmosphere at, at a place like Libel field that, you know, you can make it a capacity crowd where you can fit, you know, 3000 fans in there and, and make it uh, make it more junior football or university football friendly. Um, but I see both sides to it where, you know, you have the, you have the nice big facility, all your vendors are, can be set up and, and all your you know, ticketing and, and whatnot is can have more people and, and you can get into the big stadium. And I'm sure the players like playing at the, the bigger stadium as well. Bubba, $5 idea here before we go, because the Panda game has proven it to us uh, when you have, uh, two teams in a rivalry game. You have a, a partner like OSEG, a CFL partner, to help those universities along. That The Panda game has become bigger than the Vanier Cup because it's well-organized, it's community-based, got great roots, and, 
And I think quite fortunately for the football fan, it's produced a really good product. Those are yes. great games year great after games. year. So like in the case of Regina, uh, play all your games at Liable Field. Save your game at the end of the year for the Saskatchewan Huskies. Make that the provincial rivalry game and put it in the big stadium. As for that shoulder uh, part with, with Calgary, I have been in the ear of the University of Calgary for 15 years on that, and they just refused to do it. So, you know, uh, shoulder about 2,800 seats. It, it, would, it, it shows well. That's the other thing is that get into facilities – that that work for you that show well that create atmosphere that create energy it's one of the reasons why mac in your town uh works so well it's the right size it's the right field uh, it, it's uh if they went into tim hortons uh the mcmaster marauders would get lost in there They're, in their own facility they work really really well you know guys this this is the cfl this week and at the end of the day though discussion on Canadian ball, I think is just an outstanding thing that we've just done here. So I've got to thank all of you here, Taylor Shire out in Regina, Will Nolt in Calgary, Jim Mullen, our boy out in BC. So thank you so much for joining us, folks. I hope you really enjoyed the podcast again, wherever you find your favorite podcast, you can find us on the Thai Cats audio network. If you are watching on YouTube, hit that link and subscribe and like, and come on, you're going to get all this kind of content every single week coming on you on a Monday afternoon. Again, thank you so much, guys. Again, this is the Tiger Cats Audio Network. This has been the CFL This Week. I'm your host, Bubba O'Neill. See you next week. The CFL This Week with Bubba O'Neill. Subscribe, like, and get the deepest takes on Canada's game every Monday.